Leviticus is essentially a book of laws, and there are various ways to interpret which laws still remain in effect and which are probably relics of a different cultural context. For Christian interpreters, we often assess how closely a particular passage seems to align with the heart of Jesus' Jesus's message. Today's reading seems pretty close to the heart of Christ's teachings. Let's listen for that. So from Leviticus chapter 19, first two verses and 15 through 18. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the Israelites and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand idly by when the blood of your neighbor is at stake. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your, in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprimand your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Here ends the reading. The passage from Leviticus is rich in its language and the way that it calls us to uh, a rather different vision of community than many of us are used to. It calls us to be our siblings' keeper, to actually reprimand one another, to let one another know uh, when we've gone astray, when we've hurt one another, or when we've hurt someone else. Uh, it's kind of a radical thing when you think about it. We're a very individualistic society, uh, and that passage from Leviticus points to something that's rather opposite that. Our gospel passage this morning, which fits quite nicely, comes from Matthew's gospel from the 22nd chapter. This is verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered him together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, still living and breathing and moving among us, stir us again this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, I have to admit, when I looked at the lectionary for this week, I breathed a deep sigh of relief. I have decided year A might be my least favorite year in the lectionary. If you've been following the readings for the past several weeks, you are aware that much of what we've been reading from Matthew's gospel has left us scratching our heads. Week after week, we get these complicated, difficult parables, some of which include violence and uh, hatred towards other you know, religious groups. And so some of it has been really difficult. And so this response from Jesus seems like a breath of fresh air. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Jesus we love. That's the one we remember. None of this casting folks into outer darkness and such. Jesus just takes it back to basics today. Jesus was a radical like that. That's an interesting word, radical. We don't always think of that as meaning 
back to basics, but radical first appears in Middle English, and it derives from the Latin word radich or radix. The word refers to roots, and originally it referred to literal roots, carrots and beets and such. To change something radically, then, was to change it from the very roots. We might more accurately say that to make a radical change is to change the roots of something or to transplant it. Of course, Jesus wasn't really changing the roots. As those of us who follow the Hebrew Bible passages uh, and listen to them, we know this. Our passage from Leviticus this morning shows that this concept, this concept of taking care of your neighbor with the same care you have for yourself, it was written into the tradition Jesus inherited and was born into. The prophets, the Torah, all of it had that core central root to it. But Jesus was calling the people back to that root, back to that radical idea, that idea that is central to the biblical tradition and the God of whom it claims to give witness, the idea that we are not our own, that we do not belong only to ourselves, the idea that we are our siblings' keepers, the idea that your well-being is wrapped up in mine, that in your flourishing and your peace, I will find my own. This Sunday, we celebrate Reformation Sunday. Many also call it Reconciliation Sunday, but I think that would be getting a bit carried away. The truth is that there are still deep fractures in the church universal. Thankfully, the ecumenical movement and the interfaith movement have moved us towards unity in some ways. As Protestants, you see, we inherited a faith that was pretty stern, pretty heady, based only on theology and logic, completely devoid of sacramentality. Because of the ecumenical movement, liturgies and rituals have found their way back into our lives in the UCC. But today, I want to celebrate the Reformation by lifting up this radical idea, this idea that lies at the root of Christianity, that was there at the root of Judaism as well. It is, in fact, the root of many traditions expressed in its own way. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Simple, radical. Now, we all struggle to live this out perfectly. If we didn't, we would probably wouldn't have churches. That is what is so tricky here. Jesus gives us a boiled down, simple formulation of what is required of us, but in reality, he has made things a bit more challenging. Stripped down of all the pomp and circumstance, Jesus asks his listeners to consider honestly whether or not they are living this out. There's not a lot of wiggle room. Are you loving God? Are you loving your neighbor? Are you doing it with all your heart, strength, mind, soul? And we all have our own relationships with God. And the ways that we express our love of God is, are diverse, unique to each of us. The question of how we love our neighbors is probably even more complicated. Who is our neighbor? There's a person who's often sleeping on the concrete slab outside our boiler vents. I walk by that person regularly, as many of us do. To me, that means that I am far from perfectly loving my neighbor. Those two questions, are you loving God, are you loving your neighbor, could probably keep us busy for some time. We could devote our lives to answering those questions faithfully, and I think we'd live really fruitful lives. But there's another part of this question that we often skip and we can't disregard. Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. Christianity has often missed that part of the formulation. 
By assuming that all people are already narcissists who love themselves. In fact, love of self was assumed for a long time to be so inherent in who we are as people, so much so that the church for a long time preached that we needed to constantly be beaten down, to lower our opinions of ourselves. The doctrines of original sin told us that we were awful, horrible people, puffed up with pride and arrogance. It's true Sometimes we fail to see some of the ways that we aren't perfect. We make assumptions, fail to see all of our faults. We don't know ourselves perfectly. I would argue that is one of the main reasons we seek out community and why we need community. Because when we're in loving community, we can actually grow. I heard a TED talk recently about anti-racism, and the presenter used the example of saying or doing something racist as having something stuck in your teeth. When you have food stuck in your teeth, you want somebody to tell you that, don't you? Why is it any different? when we say something racist, and we could make the same argument when we say something sexist, when we use the wrong pronouns for someone. We should want to be corrected, right? We need others to help us understand ourselves, to help us grow. And so today I want to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart and my practice, something I think is central to understanding the Reformation, and that is confession. Martin Luther's original critique of the church was of the penitential system. In this medieval system, salvation required you to be in a state of grace. Baptism washed away the stain of original sin, so a freshly baptized baby was completely free of sin and destined for heaven. But almost immediately, they started committing sins, And according to the church, they never stopped committing sins. And every time that a person sinned following baptism, they would fall out of this state of grace. In order to be back on level terms, they would need to confess to a priest and then complete the required penance. Sometimes this was prayers. Sometimes it was works of charity and love. And sometimes, you got it, it was money. The famous selling of indulgences, which meant that if you were wealthy, you could essentially buy your way out of your sins. In that sense, not a lot has changed in the last 500 years. But Luther's concern was not primarily that this was unfair. He wasn't really all that concerned that this was tougher on poor people than on wealthy person. Luther was not that woke. Luther was concerned because he saw that this created a constant sense of spiritual torment in our conscience. Luther's argument was that if we could ever be assured God loved us and looked at us, that if we could never be assured, sorry, that God loved us and looked at us with grace despite our shortcomings, then we would spend our entire lives obsessed with trying to perfect ourselves. This would mean that we would never be free to love our neighbors because we would be mired in our own self-hatred. Now, this is not to suggest that Martin Luther had a particularly rosy idea of himself or that he taught a form of easy self-love and self-acceptance. There's A metaphor attributed to Luther, which all seminarians seem to learn despite it being documented nowhere that Luther ever said it, but it captures his general view of us. He said that human beings are like piles of manure covered in snow. Luther believed that we were awful, sinful beasts, incapable of really living godly lives. Luther believed that that himself and everybody else was constantly beset by sin, failing and flailing no matter how hard we strived to be holy. In fact, Luther 
believed that nothing we could ever do would ever be enough to make up for how badly we had failed. I know that doesn't sound inspiring, but stick with me a minute. Because in an odd way, Luther goes so far down the rabbit hole of self-loathing that he comes out the other side with something rather beautiful. He falls into a bucket of manure and comes out smelling like roses. Because Luther believed that nothing we ever did could make up for our failures. And he trusted that for some reason, God actually did still love him. And so he concluded that our salvation, our belovedness by God, was accomplished only by God, through grace alone. That it was only through Christ, the revelation that God loves humanity just as we are in every moment of our human lives, that we could have faith. That alone was worth believing. Luther realized that there was no state of grace and state of sin. Rather, we are simultaneously always sinners and saints. In every moment of our lives, sin is present. It isn't just something we do. It is simply in the water. And in every moment, God is looking at us with nothing but love. We can't earn God's love because there's nothing we could do to ever lose it. The forgiveness that we long for God has already given. But Luther still believed, as do I, that we need confession. Confession is the place where we bring ourselves before God and before one another, and I would argue before ourselves, with all our imperfections, the things we can't forgive ourselves for, the things we do not like about ourselves, all of it. We bring it before God so that we can hear those words. You are forgiven. These for Luther are the most important words. No matter what you have done, no matter how much you might be disappointed in yourself, no matter how bad anyone says you are, God is looking at you with love. Even if you feel like a pile of manure, as Luther did, God sees something precious, something beautiful. Faith, then, for Luther and for us of the Reformed tradition, is about trusting God's word on who we are. Beloved, beautiful, even if messy, rather than our own word on who we are or someone else's word. Thank God for that, because we have all, I believe, thought and said some pretty terrible things about ourselves, have we not? Confession allows us to show our whole selves to God and to one another. It isn't because God needs to hear about it. God doesn't need the laundry list of the things we've done wrong. God already knows that. We do confession because we need a community of people that can reassure us and remind us that, yes, even that part of us is loved. The work of confession is the work of seeing ourselves more fully and learning to hear those words of grace that God speaks over us, even in the moments when we don't think we deserve to hear them. You are forgiven. You are precious. You are beloved. We cannot hear those words if we have absorbed too much toxicity about ourselves. Unlike Luther, I don't think any of us are piles of manure. I think Luther still had some work to do in his own sense of his self. And I don't think God sees only a covering of snow. I believe God sees us all the way through and loves us all the way through. God sees the hurt, the pain, the shame. God sees all of that and loves you. We confess so that we can love ourselves. 
We confess because unless we are told over and over and over again that we are beloved by God, we run the risk of forgetting that, of slipping back into self-doubt and self-hatred, which is also self-trusting of ourselves alone. That will always get in the way of loving our neighbor and loving God. Martin Luther, imperfect as he was, started the Reformation. He gets credit for that. But it is up to each and every one of us to continue it. It is up to us to follow in the radical footsteps of Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again to show that there is nothing that can separate you from God's love. And so let the Reformation be what it always was, a call to community, not obsessive self-examination. Let it be a call to see one another fully and to be seen fully, because we can only love what we know. Let it be the call to a confession of faith that moves mountains, a faith that conquers death, A faith that is, in fact, a mighty fortress. Faith that in every moment in our lives, at every turn, we are beloved by God. Thanks be to God. Amen.